there's something that I was thinking about that just occurred to me that wasn't... I've never seen anyone talk about it, but I think it's really real. So people talk about the diminishing returns effect of each... Uh, each each console generation since like the PS3, right? Really, I think it started with that. Like the jump from PS3 to four was much less appreciable than two to three, one to two, so on, right? When people talk about diminishing returns, they mostly talk about graphics, but I think that there's something bigger. There's something like more important when you're talking about games and, and libraries and, and things like that and and dare I say art, that is a lot more relevant. And that's the fact that technology, advancements in technology are only as use, are they're only useful in the capacity that they can fulfill larger creative visions. Is that, is that like too, um, maybe that's, that's too complicated. So what I'm I'm trying to say is I'm I'm pulling up an interview it's from Schmupplations called uh, well it's a translated interview from Schmupplations wonderful archive of translated uh, interviews with Jap mostly Japanese game devs uh, it's called what is game design three perspectives um uh, this is an interview I think I've referenced it before uh, but it's with Hideo Kojima. Who I don't have to introduce, uh, Satoshi Tajiri, the creator of uh, Pokemon, and Koichi Nakamura, who is the... I'm, I'm going to, like, smack my head when I... Dragon Quest! <laughs> <laughs> that was... I was like, it is... It is... Dra he is Dragon Quest, right? He has a long... Oh, my God. He has a long history but he has a really interesting quote um he has a really interesting quote here let me see let me scroll down to his where he talks about the way that he looks at game design and this is an art an interview from like the 90s and he says um says another approach to game design is to take a new piece of hardware and ask yourself what is it capable of how could i use it it may be that new design insights come to you as a result of exploring those possibilities. I doubt the person who invented titanium had any idea it would end up being used in everything from golf clubs to glasses. Similar, similarly, between uh, consider the SRAM technology. PCs had long had the ability to save data between games, but the person who first saw that technology and realized, I could make a huge console RPG now, that's a person who is capable of game design. So I think that this outlook is is really fascinating. And I see I see the almost like inverse of it today. So what he's talking about is I don't know, pretty self-evident. I'll belabor the point, however. Just for you. When there are certain games that were not possible to make on consoles until certain technological innovations had occurred, right? The fact that now, you know, oh, the this console, this system comes out, the Famicom, whatever. And the Famicom has like, you know, on on was it Zelda? Zelda had the battery saves, right? That wasn't introduced in Zelda 2. That was Zelda 1. Um something like that comes out and you go, "Oh, now hang on, wait." So when I load the game up, it doesn't just start from scratch. I can actually load data from a, a previous a previous game, a previous instance. Pardon, my neighbor's kids are really loud. You might hear them in the background. Uh, what can I do with that? And you make you can make something. You can now make something like Dragon Quest. So there are there are games that are, are not possible to make until technological advancements come about. I think one of the reasons I wasn't alive. But I think one of the reasons that something like Mario 64 was so exciting is that you literally couldn't make that game before that, before the N64, before a 64-bit console. You could, well, you could, you could make things kind of close to it. There was like 32-bit systems and all that. But 
I think in general, my point stands, right? Like you, you could maybe make slightly scrappier versions of these things. You can't make, um, you couldn't make Final Fantasy uh, seven on the N64, you know, you had to make that on the PS1 because it had the discs. You could, you had to put that thing on three discs to convey the scale and scope of that game, right? When they remade Resident Evil 3 for the N64, that is like a remake. That is like from the ground up, practically. It might be using some of the same code, but a lot of it is like crunched down, especially asset-wise, right? Resident Evil 3 on the PlayStation 1, you might, you, you could take a certain perspective on it and look at those as being two different games. RE3 on the PS1 is like a different game to the one on the N64. The, you could not make the PS1 version on the N64. You needed the technological advancement. And I think when we talk about diminishing returns, it actually goes beyond just like, well, the graphics can't get that much prettier, right? It's if I if, if I am a if I'm a creative, right, and I have sufficient budget, you know, genuinely what are the limits left to break on my creativity? What are the limits left on what I can depict in a game, in a in a piece of software? Uh I think one of the reasons a lot of people, some, sometimes people who grew up with gaming in the 80s or the 90s will say that it feels kind of like gaming has stagnated. And I disagree. I disagree with that because I, well, I play a bunch, I play a, a fuck ton of indie games and stuff like that. And there's always new, interesting stuff coming out. You just have to look for it. Uh, but in terms of like big budget games, I think it, there is some validity to the idea that those have stagnated because it's like, yeah, if you grew up and you went from Mega Man X to, to Super Mario 64 to like Final Fantasy X, your fucking mind got blown every two years. And that doesn't really happen anymore because it's like, <laughs> it's like... It's, there are no new gates that are being unlocked by technology. And in some ways, I think that's actually a great thing. I think it's great that now there's just there's just like a, a very free, open playground. And of course, there's limitations that are placed on devs by budget. And if you want to make something that looks a certain caliber, yes, you do need a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of people. But it's possible. Like, it's very poss- it's way more possible now um, than it was 20 years ago, right? So, I think the, the lack of excitement, right? Because you look at, like, people look at, at games on the PS5 and they think, did this have to be on the PS5? Like, this could have been on the PS4. And in fact, a lot of those games are on the PS4. It was kind of funny to get comments on that clip that I made of people saying, what about Gran Turismo 7? What about Returnal? What about this? And I would and I would be like, like, hey, you missed that. And I was like, no, those have ports. GT7 is on PS4. Returnal has been on Steam for like two years. It's like, <laughs> there's no, you, you look at the, your game, the game you're making. And I think genuinely from a, from a, a, a from a business and also from an artistic point of view, you kind of look at it and you think, is there a reason this has to be on the PS5? Like just just today or yesterday or something, um, people were talking about these Square Enix earnings reports where they said that uh, FF7 Remake Part 2 didn't live up to their expectations. And it's like, well, you got, well, for a, a couple of reasons. Number one, it's a Part 2 to a game that's like it's not really easy to just jump into it because also from what i understand i don't know enough about this i haven't heard enough spoilers from what i understand of ff7 remake uh those games like are are like reinterpretations of the original plot like i know some weird shit happens that and it diverges heavily from the original at some point but the um 
the other big factor is like shit i forgot that was that's been a ps5 exclusive like you guys launched that on the on the ps5 a console that has i mean it's got like a decent install base for what it's worth i think it's a little bit under what the ps4 was at this point and it's same point in its its life its life cycle Ugh. i'm talking too fast my mouth can't keep up i'm thinking too fast my mouth can't keep up um but like did that have to be on the on the PS4? Sorry, on the PS5? Could that was there no way that it could have been on the four? Right? And and it it's like I don't know what you guys expected. I don't know exactly why it was so necessary. Maybe it is. Anyone who's played Rebirth, uh let me know. Was it imperative? Could you not see a single world where that game was able to fit on a PS4? Maybe the graphics looked marginally worse. Maybe it didn't. Maybe like uh, the the cloud bath scene didn't have ray ray tracing on the water in the bath when he was getting gang banged. Sorry, that would be that would have been remake. That would have been part one. I'm actually a fraud. Uh, but yeah, I, I, it's like this weird. It's this weird state where. Trying to think if like there's other examples. I, I suppose in film there was kind of a, maybe an, an example of this just because you know we went from like film to color and digital and all that, and then visual effects had a very long technological evolution, you know, until the modern day where kind of everything has good effects, right? Uh, for the most, everything has at least passable, like, CGI these days. I'm sure there's examples that, that don't, but, you know, I, I, I think it's because games, well, with film, it's like, you can just kind of point a camera at someone, and it's like, ah, I mean, that's real life, you know? There isn't this sort of interesting, do I want to call it a hurdle? This interesting factor that games have to, have to account for, which is that they are all digital. <laughs> They are all fake. There are FMV games, I suppose, but you know, that's those are a little different. I don't want to get too lost in the weeds on like too much nuance and all that. But I, I genuinely feel like there's a, a problem. There's like a generational problem where it's like Yeah, you know, you could sell you could sell a console based on this is the only place you're going to get to see this, right? It used to be a big selling point, for instance, that fighting games were really close to the arcade, right? Soul Calibur 1, I think, like looked better on home consoles than it looked on the arcade. This is the only place you're going to get to see this. And now it's like, not really. <laughs> the only reason that... that uh, the only reason that it's exclusive is just because of an exclusivity deal for the most part. There's no technological reason, you know? And I find that most... A lot of the most interesting games coming out nowadays tend to be from uh, small indie studios that are not pushing the limits of, of graphics and stuff like that. This is all funny because I'm going to talk about Space Marine 2 later in this podcast. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, a little bit of food for thought. Where where else is there to go? Because yeah, on one hand, it is... It, it it It's probably a little bit scary from a console manufacturer standpoint that it almost feels like the hardware is interchangeable at this point between systems. I guess the Switch is a little bit weak, but... Um, compared to the other two. But... It's also kind of cool, you know? It's like anyone could just kind of do anything now. <laughs> uh, so that's that. that I, I was I was, I was was chewing on that a little bit. 